Welcome to Love and Time of Corona, episode 9, where we talk about Ken Forrester vineyards and are joined by none other than Ken Forrester himself. I might as well start. I think um, people will join on. Um, we're now five past. So, yeah, everyone knows this is fun, this is interactive, it's storytelling. We're not going to tell you about the acids in the wine or what belling it was picked at. Or we might tell you how delicious the wine is. We might tell you how awesome my little unicorn hat is. Um, but we're not going to tell you about the sugars and stuff in the wine. Um, I see a lot of people are coming on now, so that's cool. So I'm just going to start off a little bit about Ken. I met Ken last year properly at the Cape Wine Academy 40th. And then um, I saw him again uh, more recently at, uh, with Frank and Pete at, um, at uh, the chef's table at the food barn. Um, Ken Forrester as an estate and Ken Forrester as the person is full of life, it's big, it's, 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 it's a stalwart in the industry. Um, you know, there's a lot of history to the state starting um, in the late 1600s, it was granted to a guy from Simon van der Simon van der Stel, granted to a guy called Frederick Boot, and there were some vines grown in 1694, and there were a few owners, um, the, one, the one the Skoltz family named the farm Skoltzenhofen in 1993, I believe Ken bought it, um, on an auction, and then it was quite dilapidated. They fixed it, and th they had their first wines um, under the Ken Forrester wine names the next year. And 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 the Ken Forrester wines are the, the whole idea around the Ken Forrester wines is to make them accessible to all. So you've got a petit range, you've got a reserve range, you've got the icon range. And if you look at Ken Forrester's institution, it's and we've we've spoken to uh, we've done a lot of these and. You will see how strong the social upliftment thing is. Um, and I know Ken's very keen on improving the life of the people that work for him, and more specifically in the field. So a lot of the, the farming is done by hand and manually, and it just creates jobs and hopefully makes a better life for a hell of a lot of people. In terms of the other social upliftment, the organic certification. In terms of Ken, and we're going to be speaking to Ken. So Ken knows, Ken's got stories. <laughs> Ken uh, is, uh, as I said, he's a stalwart in the industry. Um, he, he's known as Mr. Shannon because he, he makes seven or eight Shannon Blancs. We'll talk about that now. He's got the flagship, which is an FMC. Also got a, a few little things. Ken's got a very dirty little secret. Hopefully he'll tell us about it. We're tasting Grenache. That's the wine that we, we chose from the Woodies. I know people have got a whole range of Ken's wines. So I'm going to ask Ken to speak about Shannon. I'm going to speak about Grenache, and Ken will obviously speak about Grenache, and SGM, which is Syrah, or Shiraz, Grenache, Mouvedre. And I think that's where I'm going to leave it, you know. Um, I, I can talk all day, but that's not what, what, what we're here for. So, Ken, um, people can just ask questions, you know. Tell us how it all started. I mean, you came down, you bought a dilapidated wine farm. How did that all happen? Super. Harry, thanks very much for the intro. Well. I had no idea you knew so much about me anyway. Hectic. But, yeah, um, yeah. 1993, um, I was in Johannesburg. We had a restaurant. We had a few restaurants in Johannesburg. I was in partnership with a mad Frenchman called Marc Hubert. It was Ile de France, La Bastille, La Beaujolais, Gatrils. And um, we were having a pretty tough time. Things were, were bleak. South Africa was going to its first uh, democratic elections in um 94 in april 94 and towards the end of 93 things were getting really out of control we had that library gardens march and our restaurant downtown we had 16 of our windows shot out that day i mean hugging the floor truthfully was a, was a sensation that you needed to get used to you know, you'd, you'd hit the deck and just hold like black crazy um and we decided we came down to a wedding to a friend's wedding down here in the cape while we were here, I took my wife around to see some of the guys I was buying wines from 35 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. If you were buying wine, it wasn't just a call to a distributor. You had to go and get wine from Spear. You had to go to Paxburg, you had to go to Rustenburg, you had to go to each and every property. Nobody would even ship the wine with somebody else. Rustenburg wouldn't consider shipping their wine with Spear. There were no, there were no distribution agents apart from the big guys, like Distillers Corporation, and Stellenbosch Farmers Winery of the day. So I was buying wine from all the private guys. I took my wife around, showed her, and we came across this property. 
um, 50 hectares in what they call the Golden Triangle of Stellenbosch, right so between Stellenbosch and the ocean underneath the Helderberg. And this place was going on an auction. And I thought, that's just crazy. How could this 50 hectare property with a homestead built in 1694, the roof caved in on the homestead, the house standing derelict, the whole property apparently had been vacant for six years and had squatters staying in the houses over time. Um, it was just a complete mess. And I couldn't believe that somebody could own this thing and not love it. It was just incredible that all this history was sitting there and totally ignored. We spoke to the auctioneer and we made a cheeky offer or two and they, were, they told us politely to disappear. They weren't interested in, in, in the offers I made. And I told my wife one evening at home in Joburg, I said, you know, I guess there's just a time in your life where you've got to let things go and that's the way it is. I'm, you know, it's obviously just going to be too much money for us. The next morning I got up at five and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to Cape Town, I'm going to that auction. I got on a plane and I flew down here. I went to Phyllis Hands, who was the, in charge of the Cape Wine Academy in those days. And they said to Phil, you know, how's it, but she said, what are you doing here? I said, well, if you're free for lunch, I'll tell you then. Until then, I won't really know. I'm just going to go and look at a property. And I came down, looked at this property. Uh, the auction started and I bought the property on auction. Last man standing. I just had my hand up in the air and we, we got the property. And um, Michael James was the auctioneer and he had a 730 BMW a little aerial sticking out the boot, a Siemens car phone in those days. There were no cell phones. 25 years ago, the cell phone hadn't been invented yet. And um, I said to him, do you mind if I use your phone? He said, well, where are you phoning? I said, for the check I just written you, I think I could phone anywhere on the planet. It doesn't matter. But I need to speak to my wife and tell her how much trouble we're in. And I'd, I'd overspent like crazy. It was way past what we'd agreed that, that we could spend. I bought it. And that was it. And that's how it all started. Took us a year to move down here fully. Um, the vineyards were in quite good shape. The neighboring farmer was farming them for his own account. He was having a ball. Um, and I came in and took over. I made the first wine in 94 with Mike Dobrovich. And I made a Sauvignon Blanc with Mike. And we had the most amazing day and night. Um, his wife locked us out of her house that night. So we slept in the cellar. Um, it was just, you know, the, the crazy things that we brought out. I had to find barrels because he had no, no tank space for me. So I managed to get some secondhand white barrels from Kevin Arnold, who had made some Chardonnay with Hempies de Toy. And then somehow there'd been some discussion or no discussion or a, mis a disagreement about whose wine it was and whose grapes it was. And so they had this wine in barrels. So I had to buy the wine and to get the barrels. And that, then we emptied all that wine out, bottled that Chardonnay, drinking wine for our friends, and then made our first Sauvignon Blanc in a barrel, and it was a Blanc Fumé. And that was our very, very first wine. And the second year, I then went on to make Chenin Blanc with Martin Minot. And Martin, truthfully, I think one of the very, very best winemakers in the Cape. He's retired now, sitting on a beach, literally sitting on a beach up at Azerfontein, um, just got out, sold his, his business, and uh, he's as happy as a sandman. He really is just thrilled to be out of the game. He's sold the brand. The brand continues. I still work um, up at that cellar. I still work with the winemaker. The winemaker is the ex-winemaker from Jordan, a guy called Brendan. Uh, yeah, I know guy. him. I know him. He's yeah. a Canadian master too, so I know him well. Great. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, he's one of the few winemaker, Cape Wine Master winemakers, yeah. Um, he's a, a thorough geek, proper, proper detail, detail kind of guy. And um, he and I still work together. We still do some, some stuff together up there. We started the FMC in that cellar. I said to Martin, I want to make the best white wine in the world. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa Charlie, you've only just got here. What do you mean you're going to make the best white wine? So I said, well, what's the statute of limitations? How long are you going to wait? You need to be here 10 years, 20 years, kids, why, why, what's the deal? No, he said, well, for starters, what grapes are you going to use? So I said, we're going to use Chenin Blanc, of course. And he was like, no, no, you're crazy. That's not going to happen. So we did. We made Chenin Blanc in uh, 1997. We started in 98. We made it again. And we special barrels, and we had the barrels toasted, and we had acacia heads put on the barrels. 
and we stirred the lees and we added DAP to the ferments and we used wild yeast and da 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 da. We did everything you could do except climb into the bunghole. I mean, we literally did everything you could possibly do to that wine. And when we opened up that wine in 2018, when we decided to kind of look at it for bottling, the wine was absolutely disgusting. It was terrible. It was awful. So we didn't do anything with that at all. We made in 19, we made it again. And it, we was kind of a little bit of romance going on. Martin and I, late one afternoon in the cellar, decided it would just get better. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sure it'll get better. Yeah, we told each other it would get better, so we bottled it. We never sold a single bottle of that 19. We opened it all up a year later and poured it away. And finally, in 2000, we made a wine. And that, that uh, sorry, the 2000 vineyard was our very, vintage was our very first that we bottled. And we took that to London, the London Wine Trade Fair, journalist by the name of Matthew Jukes, who still writes for the, I think, the Daily Mail, plays his own wine column. He's become the champion for the Australian wines very much. He runs a top 100 for Australia. And Matthew Jukes tasted the wine and said, my God, that's amazing. What is that? What is your blend? So I said, no, it's actually just Shannon, no blend. Oh, but you put a little bit of something in there. What have you blended? I said, no, 100% Shannon. Well, he said, that's the most fucking marvelous Shannon I've ever tasted. So I said, Matthew, I think we could put that on the label. You know, we can do that for you. So um, we put the FMC on the label. And it was quite fortunate that the FMC was Forrester for me, Minot for Martin. So it was the Forrester Minot Shannon. And on the back of that, Martin brought out a, a label, a wine called Synchronicity because of the synchronicity of the fact that we've kind of covered this Forrester Minor Shannon, the FMC. And the, the FMC now is in its 20th vintage, 2019. This will be our 20th vintage of FMC this year, or last year we may. Um, it's in barrel, the, the 2019, about to go to bottle, about to get released. We'll, we'll have that after the lockdown. That'll be coming out. And uh, just it's Sorry, your, your FMC. So the FMC has won more awards than, I don't know, Oprah Winfrey. It, it's like, it is, one of, <laughs> it is probably one of the best, uh, well, it is. It is one of the best Chin and Blancs in the world. And it's beating, I remember speaking to Ken last time, and I said, if being a young gun means making wine naturally and with spontaneous fermentation and all this stuff, and that makes you a young gun, then Ken's probably the youngest gun around. Am I right? Yeah, I've been making that with wild yeast for 20 years. Yeah, and what we learned the first three years was stop messing with the wine. Let the wine make itself. You know, get, you, get out of the way. You know, just, you could stay, I mean, get great fruit and don't mess it up. You know, just look after it. Let the wine make itself. And that's what we learned. So it was hands off, wild yeast fermentation, um, a light filtration at the end. And the fact that there's sometimes a kind of... Um, but try to sweetness character on the FMC is because we harvest that vineyard consecutively. We go through and we pick the vineyard five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. Each vintage is slightly different. Last year we picked nine times. This year we picked ten times. And we pick little bar little parcels and we make that wine in barrel. So we pick, crush, make three barrels and then wait four or five days and then pick, crush, make five barrels. It's just little batches and if we have any botrytis in the vineyard, we harvest that and we let that ferment. So you get some of that botrytis character in the wine. Um, people are always quite interested as to what the percentage is. You know, frankly, I don't know. It's enough. It works out just fine. The numbers are fairly boring. It's really just what it tastes like and, and what that's about. For me, that's really what's important. The idea of that FMC is to make a, a gorgeous, rich, powerful wine that's really elegant. And it's that contradiction of power and elegance that I think every winemaker seeks, strives to get. You know, while, so while, while we're on the Chenin Blanc, you know, uh, you've got Ken's um, reserve wines that you can get. And he's got a reserve wine, uh, the reserve Chenin. It's old vine. I think that it's even old vine. There's old vines. Um, uh, there's the old vine project. We must get um, yep. on. But... You can buy an old vine, Chenin Blanc, that's made beautifully and it's been oaked. I think it's like 150 bucks. It's unheard of. And that's the, and, and, and uh, I think, 120. I'm, sorry? 120 rand, yeah. 120 bucks. And I think Ingram's on here. He's, he, uh, I do a lot of the wines for his tours. 
that's the wine I use because it's, it's it, if you think about all the stuff that's going in on that wine, and it's 120 wine, it's 20 rand above the average of the wines that we've selected for this whole series, which we were trying to choose wines that are accessible. That is the most accessible top end wine you're gonna you're gonna get. It's it's, it's pretty amazing. So, and that's the same with the whole um, the whole Ken Forrester Reserve range, you know. But um, Ken Ken's Ken's Mr. Shannon. He's I think he makes seven or eight Shannons. Am I right in saying that? No, at least that many. And I've kind of I look back over the years. We've done special projects for people and made other little batches of Shannon. Um, we, we've got Shannon going on all the time. I've got, at the moment, we're busy working with some Swatland fruit. Um, I've got a friend up there with a the butchery, and I went up there to go and see him. I said, where's your old man? He said, no, he's just out there pulling out a vineyard. I said, hey, what vineyard? No, 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 that old Shannon vineyard. So I drove up to the vineyard, and I said, him, what are you doing? Um, Noli, what are you? No, he said, he's going to take this out, this old vineyard. Nobody wants to pay for the fruit. And then I said, stop, stop. Nobody's here, and I'll pay for the fruit. How much do you want? Let's, let's settle this. We kept that vineyard and we make a Swatland Shannon Blanc now as well, just to add to our kind of bunch of, of goods. We have the Petty Shannon, the Shannon Reserve, the FMC, the Dirty Little Secret, the Swatland Shannon. We make a tea noble late harvest out of Shannon Blanc. We make the sparkling wine out of, out of Shannon Blanc, 100% Shannon. And then we've got another, we do three Shannons, two other Shannons for Woolworths. Um, we do Shannon for a supermarket in the UK, we do Shannon for, um, we do a Shannon called the Workhorse for Marks and Spencers in the UK as well. And, you know, Workhorse was in fact the kind of inspiration behind the name Sparkle Horse. If you take the Workhorse grape to South Africa and you make a sparkling wine, it's not a big jump to go from a Workhorse to a Sparkle Horse. And literally, we were in the UK, um, uh, we were walking along the, the bank of the, of the UK, Thames coming up from Borough Market. And as we were walking along, they'd just redone that whole area and they had a carousel. And I looked at these carousel horses and the lights and the whole thing, and this kind of sparkling thing. And I said to T and my wife, I said, that's it, that's gonna be my new lady. And literally we took a photograph and I gave it to the artist and she rendered that photograph and all she did was turn the horse around. It was going in the other direction. And so that's how the Sparkle Horse label came about, was literally just seeing that happen in London. It was great. So, yeah, we make about a dozen different channels. But, Ken, if you take a selfie with that, the horse will be the right way again. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the horse could be going the right way if you were standing on the center of the carousel looking up. But if you're looking in, so it just depends on which side you're looking at. I'm not sure if everyone knows why the theme was Sparkle Horse. It's because of Ken's, um, it's a Chenin Blanc MCC, Method Cup Classique. It's um, our champagne style of uh, the way we make our, our champagne, uh, Method Cup Classique. There's not many Chenin MCCs around. There are a few. Um, I know from a Cape Wine Academy perspective, we use the Sparkle Horse. We used it in the Cape Wine Master Exam, actually. And... Um, uh, I know De Morgan's on does one, but there's not many, and I don't know why because it's so beautiful. You know, it's got such a nice, you get a nice apple f and the, the biscuity fruits and the slight little sweetness to it, which is amazing. So I figured out when we started making wine that I was going to need some kind of mainstream customer, and I got hold of Alan Mullins in um, 1994, and I said to him, "We've just started. We've got a Chenin Blanc. We'd like to get together with you and show you what." And we got our first order from Woolworths in that year, which was just a godsend. It really was amazing. And we've been working with Woolworths since 1994. That was the, been our background, our sole kind of um, main big customer. And it's always been a, a lot of fun and tasting with Alan, working with Alan, and making up blends with Alan. He's got a fantastic palate. He's not just a great guy, but I mean, a party animal to boot. He's got a great palate. And he wanted to do a range of wines, his kind of signature wines. And we worked together on a blend of Shannon, which we put into Woolworths. And it's just launched, it launched towards the end of last year, September or so last year, and it sold out completely. Um, there's, there's really, um, we've obviously got to get together and do another one. But it, it really was a lovely, rich, rich wine. That is the um, 
Old Vine Shannon basically barrel selections of the Old Vine Shannon and therefore just a little more oak than, than what we bottled for ourselves is the Old Vine Shannon. So it's old vineyards, vineyards planted in 1974. It's barrel fermented in French 400 liter barrels. Um, not too much new oak, about 20% new oak. And then that was just a selection of barrels that we put together for Alan. And I'm thrilled to say it's been a great success. The wine sold out in six months. So we'll have to make some more bags. Yes, we will. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Guys, I, I just want to say, blending with Ken is always such fun. So he always comes out with these little magic little secrets, actually. So the fact that he's got a wine called Dirty Little Secret is very apt. <laughs> You know, but these youngsters, looking at these youngsters and, and these hipsters, and they're all making these, these cloudy wines, and you say to them, like, dude, what's going on in your glass? What's all that murky stuff there? And they go, no, man, that's natural wine. Like, it's cool, you know? And you go, yeah, but why is it cloudy? No, man, it's natural. Don't you understand? Natural. We don't filter. So I'm going, yeah, but why is it cloudy? I make natural wine that's unfiltered, but it's not cloudy. You've got to be a little careful with this stuff. You can't be messy. You know, you're a messy winemaker. And I thought, you know, before I kind of get into trouble with these guys, I better go and make proper natural wine. And I had to find a vineyard. I wanted to make something really special from a special, special site. We found a vineyard up in Piccaneers Kloof at about 600 meters above sea level. The vines are planted in 1959. Um, a woman who was widowed, her husband tragically killed himself, rolled a tractor on himself up on, on the mountains up there, um, was bringing up a couple of boys, and she was cutting, uh, doing winter pruning at wherever she could find work, and she was keeping the cuttings and then rooting them and selling cuttings and making a living out of, out of producing cuttings of vines, and she planted this vineyard in 1959. And I had the pleasure of actually going up and meeting her She's a great grandmother today, and she's just about in her 90s. And going up and meeting her, and yep, she confirmed that that's the vineyard. She planted two vineyards, the Grenache vineyard and that vineyard, both in 59. And I managed to get fruit from both of those vineyards and make wine from the Grenache vineyard for the last 10 years. And we've made wine for the last three, four, five years from, from the Shannon vineyard. And that Shannon Vineyard, what I decided to do was to make a completely natural wine, neutral, old barrels, very, if any, wood trace at all. But the barrel itself, the vessel, gives the wine a rounding off and a polishing. And the French have a word which we don't even translate directly into English. The French use a word called élevage, which is to raise up or to bring up the wine. We just don't have a, a single proper word for it in English. It doesn't translate directly. But that time in the barrel creates the elevage of the wine, the upbringing of the wine. And it's the time in the barrel that's so important and the process of what takes place with oxygen and proteins, and you end up creating polymers, and those polymers eventually settle through the wine. And as they settle, they clarify the wine and filter it naturally, where the wine is filtered not by putting the wine through a filter, but by dropping a filter through the wine very slowly over time. And it's the time that makes that happen. And so we make wine like that. And then what I do is I've got, I keep the wine through into the next vintage. I harvest, get the next vintage's wine. And then we cross blend from multiple vintages to make one wine. So the dirty little secret is made from different vintages from the same vineyard, all stored in oak in natural old barrels in the cellar held at about 15 degrees we go through full malolactic, it's a natural wild yeast fermentation, and then we blend four or five vintages together. So edition three will be five vintages. Edition two, which is currently just about sold out, was just three vintages. So it's, it's an evolving wine all the time. We have old reserve wine. And if you think about it, champagne, virtually every single non-vintage champagne that you've ever had is a multiple collection of vintages, up to five, six vintages in champagne. And nobody thinks that's strange. And yet we're all very hooked up about what vintage the wine is. Well, here we have a Chenin Blanc from a single site, no vintage. And on the label, it just says edition one or edition two. And we'll have edition three coming up next.
So no vintage on that wine. And it's clear, but I had to call it dirty because it was unfiltered. And making it was a bit of a secret because I wasn't quite sure how this was going to turn out. I mean, I could have got egg on my face. So we, we decided to call it the dirty little secret. So now that you've told us about it, is it called the dirty little fact? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what can I tell you? It's a, it's a lacquer wine. It's complex. It evolves. Um, and it's, it's a small production. We look at producing about 1,800 bottles per edition. So it's tiny, tiny. So Ken, I'm, I'm going to... There's another theme to Ken, and, and if you look at his wines, it's a Grenache theme. It's also a bit of a Shiraz theme. Just for everyone, I'm just going to quickly go through Grenache and then um, Ken can talk about it. Oh, my donkey's just fell off. off. <coughs> um, so Grenache used to be, in recent history, a few years ago, the most grown grape in the world. It's now Cab Sav. <coughs> and the reason why is because of Spain. Um, and, and it's believed that Grenache actually comes from Spain. I think it moved into the Southern Rhone. And so you'll find it. And whenever you see SGM or these kind of SGM wines that we see in, in South Africa, it stands for Syrah, Shiraz, whatever you want to call it, Grenache and Mouvedre. And those are very classic blends. When people ask me about Grenache, it's much lighter body than a Shiraz. You can call Shiraz. But it's, it's, for me, it's like, the, it's like the female Shiraz. It's got the spiciness. It's got the red fruit. It can't even be slightly... Uh, meaty it can definitely accumulate alcohol and um, and if you look at it it's usually yeah, you can you can usually see see through it it's, it's lighter in color so that's Grenache if you look at it you're looking at red you're looking at um, strawberries some cherries um, and I, 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 I get spice usually depending on where it's made um, so that's a normal uh, Grenache Ken do you want to add to that do you want to talk about your Grenache or, or Grenache Grenache is an amazing grape. In France, it's known as the, the Pinot de la Sud, the Pinot of the South. And the, I can promise you there was way more Burgundy made in Burgundy than there were grapes in Burgundy. And a lot of that Burgundy of years was out of tankers which left the south of France overnight and drove up north to Burgundy and delivered the Pinot de la Sud to the Pinot de la Nord because that burgundies were much improved by the addition of a little bit of ripe southern Grenache. And Grenache has those wonderful ripe strawberry flavors, red fruit, and it it's a lightish colored wine. Um, one of the reasons that it was quite difficult to get Grenache to work in South Africa was because Mensa here were looking for Osblut. They needed red wine to look like red wine and Grenache just didn't look like red wine. So it was this kind of light colored wine. And believe it or not, there was a lot of Grenache planted here in the Cape in the 60s. There was really loads of it. And the Grenache, um, the, the, all of the, the wines in the Cape, all of the vines in the Cape controlled obviously by the KGB of the day, uh, KWV of the day. And the, the KWV had a guy who was in charge of plant controller in Verbeteringen. His name was Pan van Zijl. And Pan van Zijl had an office in the corner of the, the cathedral building, and he was solely responsible for everything that was planted in this country. He decided how many cuttings the nurseries could make, Sauvignon Blanc or whatever it was. Pan van Zijl was the man that defined all of that. And they came up with this Grenache, this Grenache which was a willing bearer. And in those days, the wine industry was about volume and about not so anything, I mean, really, the most important thing was the yield, how many tons per hectare. And Grenache was very happy to yield 30, 40, 50 tons a hectare. I and mean, this stuff produces dense clusters of small berries and it grows willingly. And if you just give it a little bit of chicken manure and water, Grenache takes off. And the basis of the cooperative system of the day was there were 87 co-ops, I think, something like that. And the basis of the cooperative system was to get all of the fruit in. And the only criteria that the cooperatives applied was you had to have a sugar level greater than 21 bricks, 21 balling. And so at 21 balling, Grenache is slightly pink. It hasn't fully colored yet. And you could get, you could add lots of chicken manure and water 
and grow Grenache at 50 tons a hectare, deliver it at 21 or 22 balling, where no self-respecting winemaker would even try to make wine with it, and the co-op had to pay you for it because you were delivering your fruit. And so eventually what happened was the KWB got tired of the farmers taking the piss of them, and they banned Grenache, and they stopped any propagation of Grenache. And until about ooh, 15 years ago, I guess, there were only 64 hectares of Grenache left in the country 15 years ago. And of that, 34 hectares were all in Pekinesekloof, owned by the Fonzale family, the same family as Pan Fonzale, who had been in control and charge of all of these things and effectively he'd banned Grenache. So that's why you keep on hearing about Pekinesekloof Grenache, because it's the last Grenache that was left. There was one vineyard in Stellenbosch, which I was lucky enough to make wine with for about six or seven years, which was in um, um, Devon Valley. It was just a little four hectare vineyard, but that vineyard came to the end of its lifespan and we had to pull it out. So that was the very last vineyard in Stellenbosch. I've planted Grenache subsequently on three properties in Stellenbosch and Grenache now is probably one of our fastest growing red cultivars and making, uh, making a lot more wine, um, a bit of a comeback. Um, the most delicious blending wine, but it's also a great wine on its own. It's elegant, supremely elegant, with lovely, lovely fruit character. Really red fruit, delicious strawberries, pomegranate, those kind of cat cranberry kind of flavor. And, 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 it's, and it's drought resistant, so that's a good bonus for the Western Cape. I don't know about your dogs. Well, is the sixth dog gin named after you? No, no, we've only got seven dogs. No, we've, the, our dogs, we've always had a collection here, a bit of a menagerie. Um, I think our number's on speed dial at the Stellenbosch Animal Welfare. It's crazy. Um, Lorna Hughes, who runs the Stellenbosch Animal Welfare, called and she said, Ken, I've got this really great dog. I think it's kind of German Shepherdish. You're going to love it. So I said, Lorna, really, I think we're kind of up to our max here. We can't take any more. So I'm at your gate. Just open the gate and come have a look at the dog. <laughs> yeah, we took that dog too. I mean, it, it's like that. We just, um, we, we, one of the kids on the farm was running around up on the farm a week ago. And at the old main gate on the R44, she comes across five puppies. Somebody had come and delivered five puppies and just left them at our gate. And um, so we took on five puppies, five, we found foster homes for them, fortunately. And they've all gone away and but these poor dogs were in such bad condition. We got the vet in, had them all vetted and checked up and looked after. So he got five new puppies, but we just can't take another five dogs at this stage. I mean, seven's plenty. Seven's enough to keep us going. Why are you not, why do you not have a glass of wine in your, of your own wine? This one. Yes. <laughs> now, I'm going to show you something. These two glasses. And this is really interesting. These are the two glasses we use in the tasting room. These are the two glasses I use at home. This glass, in my left hand, in your right, I guess. Right. This glass is ideal for Sauvignon Blanc, for Cabernet, Merlot, for all of that kind of wine, all really kind of intense, powerful wines. This glass does a great, great job. This glass, this bigger fish bowl, I love for Chardonnay and for Grenache and for any expressive red wine, Syrah, for example, and if you taste these two glasses, if you pour the same wine into two glasses and taste the two glasses, the difference is quite remarkable. Whether or not the glasses are made by Riedel, that's not really important. The shape of the glass do is absolutely critical as to where the wine lands on your palate. And your tongue as a receptor has different areas of reception and it picks up on the front, it picks up certain flavors. On the sides, it picks up acid. On the back, it picks up more fruit. And depending on where that wine is delivered to your palate, your first impression, which is how you make up your mind as to what the wine tastes like, 
that moment you tasted, that very, very first flash second, that's your first impression. And the shape of the glass determines what the wine tastes like. It's crazy, but true. Wow. Try it out sometime. And you'll see that that glass really does no justice to the wine. This big glass for it, something like a Grenache or a Pinot, this big glass is way better. Much more fruit on it, much softer, much richer, much sweeter almost. So, Ken, what are you what are you going to do with the wine in the other glass now? I'm going to decant it into the good glass. <laughs> Nothing else to waste around here. I mean, I have these people tell me tell me about recipes for leftover wine. That's a whole rare thing. I've never seen leftover wine. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Truly, it doesn't happen in our house. I promise you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it sometimes happens in our house because we will have had two bottles of wine and we're like, no, let's go to bed. No, let's just have one more glass. And then we pour that one glass and fall asleep. And then that bottle is... Sometimes, sometimes left over. You've got to pay more attention. You've got to be a little more attentive. You can't just fall asleep on your bottle. <laughs> yeah, but I don't blame the wine. I blame the series we're watching. We're on Netflix and we're watching Sex Education. So it's quite boring. <laughs> oh, no, <it> is, yeah. <laughs> I love sex education. Don't worry, I'm learning a lot. Sex education is fantastic, Carrie. I'm with you. I love it. I love it. Is there anything else? Sorry, um, Ken, you you weren't part of the last um. Uh, wine tasting and I think it might be another one to open up to you because uh, Rebecca I don't know if you want to jump in here there was obviously there was talk of labels we actually did a Paul Kluber wine tasting and um, and we were talking about uh, labels specifically and um, I don't know what your opinion is of because of, I, I see you've got a couple of um, you know you sort of you're not sticking to a brand specifically on your label um, you know you've got nice varieties and different you know, like you've got different labels, basically, which is quite interesting. I think it's probably just as a kid, I was ADD. I couldn't focus or concentrate too well. So I never kind of settled the labels. And we kind of have families of labels that try and look the same. Um, but I, I always got to kind of come up with new labels. We're kind of working on a label right now. We're doing a pinotage. We're going to do a, a, a slightly serious. We do our petty pinotage. And we've got such a good vineyard, this Pinotage vineyard that we'd be buying from. We manage the vineyard, we look after the fruit, but it's not our, not our property, not our land. But it's the most amazing Pinotage vineyard. And I want to make something more than just petty Pinotage with it. And Pinotage is such a kind of polarizing wine. People love it or hate it. it you kind of, nobody sits on the fence for Pinotage. So we've got a label being produced right now for the artist called Drahtsitter. And we've got a, a, a typical kind of knobbly knee farmer with spiky legs and short pants climbing over a barbed wire fence, getting hooked on the fence right in the crotch. And that's the label coming up for the next pinotage. It's called Drazitum. So we're going to have some fun. But you've got to have some fun with these things. You know, wine is just wine. It's not that serious. I tell people it's not going to cure the Middle East crisis or coronavirus for that matter. It's a glass of wine that really is a social lubricant. And it's a beverage, and we should have a lot more fun with it and be a lot less serious about it. With the shutdown, we still had some grapes on the vine. Mulvedra, another one of those Mediterranean grapes. We planted the very first Mediterranean, or the very first Mulvedra vineyard here in Stellenbosch about 23 years ago. And that, nobody knew what Mulvedra was. I mean, when I told the guys I was planting Mulvedra, they were, your mood, what? Yeah, your Mulvedra. So we planted Mulvedra, and this stuff ripens forever. I've got to tell you, Mavedra could hang. We never get Mavedra off the vine before Easter normally. It doesn't matter when Easter is. If Easter was in December, Mavedra still wouldn't be right. This stuff hangs forever. So I said to our farm manager, just leave a couple of rows. We won't clear everything. And then yesterday, we went and picked that last Mavedra, crushed it, pressed it. It's sitting in a bin behind me right now in the cellar. And we've got some Mavedra there. Just to, it'll make one barrel of Mavedra. But we've got this lockdown Mavedra, which was handpicked yesterday. And then we just 
crushed it, destemmed it, put it into a bin. It's fermenting with wild natural yeast. It's really cool. It's kind of doing all the right stuff right now. We'll see. We might. We probably won't even filter it just to keep it cool. Are you calling that lockdown, Ken? Are you yeah, calling, we're calling it, it lockdown? lockdown. Yeah, okay. the lockdown yeah. of Edra. Yeah. This group, Ken, is called Love in a Time of Corona. It's after that book. <laughs> <laughs> in lockdown, we should probably get a screenshot of everybody's faces on here as the label. This is the lockdown, the kind of what everybody's doing on Zoom. It's yeah. a great time to be at. This talk, How's it, Ken? The guys, the guys from Zoom actually um, put the virus onto the planet. So that their shares could go up. <laughs> in Canada, I mean, everybody is on Zoom. It's quite, it's quite incredible. It's quite amazing. How's it, Ken? Good, man. It's good. Nice to see you. But... Yeah, you too. Just a quick story from our side um, for the guys on the group. I think it was back in 2006 or so. Um, we met He's Ken. He's doing a thing called No Mosaic. At a function somewhere in in Joburg, I think it was, and we cracked up a conversation, and yeah, and sort of kept in touch. And Ken was visiting um, Johannesburg on one of his trips, and he popped in um, with a with a little Shannon van, I think it was Ken. Um, oh, it was a pinotage, and and he came into our into our little um, uh, Bryanston Shady Lane. Um, house and found the perfect little spot for this little twig of pinotage that Nate and I got from somewhere and he found the perfect place to plant this thing for us in the garden and I think when we moved out of there um, well, many, of years later. many years later that little vine was still actually there and um, and we we only had Ken's wine at our wedding in 2007 thanks as well to thanks to Ken yeah so and you're still um, together so that's amazing <laughs> and we had an awesome gig at um at ninety one ninety six winery, mm. and then the after party in the center. I remember that. Mm. That that gig was booked at ninety six. It was a picnic, a lawn picnic, and the weather came up. It was this time of the year. It was Easter. The weather yeah. came up, and it was chaos. We, we just couldn't do the couldn't do the gig. And I phoned yeah. the Lord Charles Hotel. I knew the GM pretty well in those days. He's now the GM of the, of the um, hotel in Johannesburg, uh, the really smart place. George Cohen is his name. Um, what's a really... Uh, um, the Saxon. He's at the Saxon. I said to George, I said, is your banqueting available? What do you guys... I mean, is it open? He said, what are you talking? What do you mean, what's it open? I said, have you got a function on? Because we're about to move 300 people into your banqueting hall for a... We've got a party. We've got, we got watershed coming down. We've got this whole thing. And that morning, we moved that party into the banqueting hall of the Lord Charles Hotel. As people arrived at 96, we turned them around down to the Lord Charles, and we had the party at the Lord Charles. And we ended uh, up back here at the cellar with the whole band, um, taste, doing a little wine tasting, a little after party wine tasting. Um, uh, <laughs> a tasting. You were pulling the wine out of the barrel with the, that huge injection. <laughs> <laughs> He's done that for us as well before now, Craig and Nat. <laughs> and Ken, so so what's your favorite wine of the moment, sir? Sure. Uh Rebecca, we we're having we had a, a couple of bottles of gypsy last night. We had the 2011 Gypsy. Um we were just drinking deliciously. And on the back of that, I thought I'll go and pull out a, a, a French 2011. Um, from a very top producer, um, a Gigondas. I thought we'd have a look at that. We put that away. It was terrible. So we went back on to Gypsy. So we've just been drinking Gypsy. It's been delicious, yeah. Got to go it's back and visit that French wine again today and see if, it, if it's improved. I don't know. We didn't feel like it last night. Just so you know, like Ken loves also, he, he also imports some wines and um, we've actually, he's actually helped us import a, a Chateau Neuf de Pape and a Chablis as well. Um, which we've literally just launched prior to lockdown. So have a look out for those when you uh, get back to being able to buy wines. But those those are freaking drinking so well, Ken. That Chablis is stunning. I just love it. I mean, there's a wine for anybody that doesn't love Chardonnay because that is Chardonnay at its best. It's pure, it's bright, yeah. it's so clean. 
it's just delicious and for the money it's amazing and as we all know i mean as the rand has crashed as it has thank heavens we brought it in like three months ago because that price is gone it would be 30 yeah, percent i'm, and I'm Sorry, also but... i'm also right in saying that you do the food barn you or you have or you are or you you do one of the yeah we make, make wine for, for for frank at food barn we got we, he wanted the syrah and I, I showed him some samples and he said we like sample a and sample b i said well frank the idea was you should choose one because you wanted a syrup. <laughs> no, I like them both. So I, I said, well, okay, well, the one has kind of got some new oak on it, and the other one is very typically classic. That's the French style of syrup. The other one is more modern. So we called it the classic and the modern. So it's syrup classic and syrup modern. And he has those two, and he does a Grenache. I do, do a Grenache for him as well. And those wines too have sold through spectacularly at the mm. food bar. Uh, yes, I mean, Frank, Frank, I think, is probably still to this day one of the very best chefs in the country. He is just amazing. And when he was at La Colombe, he was under such pressure, he'd won the best restaurant in the country award three times in a row. And everybody was kind of coming and he was tired of all the pretentious stuff that was going on. And he literally walked away and he opened up the food barn and he, his concept is that he will surf with his son every day. He will ride his horse every day. And when he gets time, he'll do some cooking. And he cooks like an angel. I mean, he cooks like a dream. His food is just magnificent. Love his food. Um, I actually saw him today. You know, I'm lucky enough to be in part of this. It's called the South Peninsula Tasting Group. I know Bex and Martin are in there. And we've got a lot of the winemakers, Kathy Marshall, Riandri. Um, Trezan, but we've also got Pete and Frank who are in there, and we've got some people who invest in wine, some people who think they know, that's me, think they know about wine, you've got winemakers, you've got uh, purchasers like uh, Bex, and you've got enthusiasts, and it's, you know, when you have a mix like that, you're not, um, you're, so Ken, yeah, I am Cape Wine Academy, but my philosophy is exactly what you said, is that wine's a social tool, it's put on this planet to bring people together, to make eye contact, to chat, and with a few, make you clever. You have a few glasses, you, you can solve the world's problems. And uh, I was brilliant at three o'clock this morning. I was absolutely on top of it. <laughs> and so, Harry, so, Ken, Ken's got the best, Ken's got the best wine, um, wine group name. What's the name of the tasting group that you guys are at, Ken? Isn't it Time Wasters? Two, the one is, uh, time, one is Time Wasters, not Wine Tasters, but Time Wasters. And the other one is Wine Swines. Uh, time wasters and wine swines. But interesting, Harry, you talked about Kathy Marshall. Kathy, um, I was Kathy's very first employer. She, her very first full time winemaking job was oh. making Chen and Bob for me. In she's Martin amazing. Isn't she? She's, oh, she's a amazing. super A super girl. A lovely child. Uh, mine is a bit really about memories. I mean, so many, so many of the, the kind of memories you have of people is the wines that you drank together, for me, certainly. Is the wines that we drank together and the fun that you had. I mean, wine always seems to be around if you're having fun. It's, it's kind of, it's, the two seem to go hand in hand without a doubt.